Dear Heavenly Father, we, we, just, we just praise you for so many things. We thank you for your protection, for your provision, for your love and mercy. And we thank you that, that as Christians we can have fun and don't have to regret the next morning. We thank you for that. So I pray that the rest of our time today we'll continue to exalt your name and point to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can stand for this. Oh,
is enough. And I don't think there's anything really to add to that. Um, what Christ did, the gift that he gives us, it's all because of him. It's nothing we can do and he is sufficient.
Back in uh, the early 1950s, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were American citizens, were accused of being spies for Russia. And we got a picture of them you can put on the screen if you guys can. They were accused of treason against their own country. They were accused of giving top secret information about radar, sonar, jet propulsion engines, and valuable nuclear weapon designs to the Russian government. And if found guilty, they would be executed. In summation, at the end of this long, long trial, their lawyer, the lawyer for the Rosenbergs, made an interesting plea, they made a very interesting plea, um, which actually became very appropriate, though not in the reasons that he intended. He said the following. If you look on the, the screen, we're having a bit of a glitch there. Thank you. Your Honor, he said, Your Honor, what my clients ask for is justice. You know, think about that for a moment. That is so us, isn't it? Because we, we always want what's fair. And we may not say it that exact way, but we're thinking, that's not fair. Why is this happening to me? You know, why, why, why this? We want everything to be fair. But if you'll, if you'll stay with me today, something we're going to see is the fact that, that we, well, actually this, that we need to remember God's amazing love. Because in his amazing love and mercy, um, he actually... Um, does not give us justice in the sense that we deserve it. Um, and he doesn't, thankfully, give us what is fair. You'll see what I mean today if you hang with me. Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today, I pray that you would give us understanding. I pray even right now in this moment, I'd ask us all just in this quiet moment just to, to prepare our hearts to hear God's word. God's word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. Sometimes we don't even really know what our motive is until the Holy Spirit helps us to see it. Maybe someone here this morning whose heart's turned cold towards God. Maybe you were a follower, but now you've lost the plot. Maybe you've not yet become a follower of Jesus Christ. Right now in this quiet moment, let's open our hearts to him. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would stir our hearts today. Help me as I speak, uh, not to speak my ideas and thoughts, but your word, and to give the accurate explanation of it. And then help us to be doers of the word, and not mere, merely hearers only. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we are, as you know, looking at Christ's three central commands. During his three years of ministry, these were, these were the three things, the three um, really invitations, not just commands. And you see them on the screen, and it's been on the wall for some time. Now we've moved to the second one, to follow me. So that one there, which has got a circle around it, when the guys get it up there, that one is where we are right now, follow me. So that's the question that we're asking ourselves in this second part of the study. I hope, I, I'm not going to test you, but hopefully you could, could shout out the question. Is this, am I a follower of Jesus? That's the question we need to be asking. Am I a follower of Jesus? Now, once again, to clarify from last week, I'm not saying, are you a Christian? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Because there are many Christians who are not following Jesus. And we're hoping to understand that as we unravel it in this study. Um, we, in, last week in our Biblical Training Center study, we, we actually looked at the, the realization that when you study a topic or something in the Bible or really whatever, sometimes it's quite helpful to look for the opposite to study it out, right? Right, class? Um, and you, you guys doing the course, help me out here. So, for example, if you're doing a topical study in the Bible on faith, you would look up the word faith in the Bible, but you would also look up what other thoughts? What's the opposite of faith? Doubt. That's right. You look up doubt because when you learn the opposite, you also learn what the thing is you're trying to understand. So let's do the same thing with our question. Our question is, am I following Jesus? And, you know, I think we may struggle sometimes just answering that question honestly and directly. And we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. I guess, I guess I am. I'm following. Let's ask the opposite question. And I think that might help us a bit more. And here's the opposite question. Am I focusing on myself. That's, at least for me, a little bit easier for me to answer. I can pinpoint 
my selfishness a lot more easily. And you see, when we're focusing on ourselves, we can be absolutely certain that we are not following Jesus in his steps because he was all about not himself while on this earth, right? We just think about all the things he did, all the ways he lived out. Last week, Matthew 6, 24 was the verse we looked at where Jesus pretty much explains this is, this is the way to figure it out. You see it on the screen, Matthew 16, 24. It says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So you tell me, we, we studied it last week. What does it mean to, well, to die to self? What does that mean? What does that mean? How do we die to self? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. We say no to things that we actually want to do. We, we, we put others before ourselves, right? We put what's best for God, first of all, and for others before what's, what's what we want to do. And, and that's hard to do. In fact, sometimes it's painful, very much so, right? But that's what he calls us to do. That is being Christ-like. There was a book a number of years ago that made the New York Times bestseller list. Its title was Looking Out for Number One. Why would a book like that become a bestseller? Because you see, it, it, it gives us permission to do what we want to do, is look out for me. What do I want? What do I need? Which is not what being a follower of Jesus Christ is meant to be doing. We need to take that on board. Um, and when we think of Jesus... You know, the one we're supposed to be following. When we think of Jesus, we picture him, and we think about, let's think about him on the cross, enduring excruciating pain, right? In fact, did you know our word excruciating actually comes from the cross, from crucis, cross? That's actually where that word came from, because how can you explain that kind of pain? While he was, think about it now. Let's, let's really think about this. While Jesus is on the cross, enduring excruciating pain, for other people, what's he doing? Is he thinking about himself? No, he's saying to the Father, you know, don't hold it against them. Don't, don't know what they're doing. And he's saying to John, John, take care of my mother. He's thinking of other people. Folks, that's who we're following or not. That's, that's our example. And um, I want to put this quote on the screen that we looked at last week from Dr. David Jeremiah. A willingness to die for our faith is one thing. But a willingness to live for him means dying to ourself a thousand times daily so that his will might be done in us. Are we? Can we? We should be able to look back over this past week and pretty quickly pinpoint a few times that we, you know, we died to ourselves. We were willing to not have what we wanted so that God's will could be done. A, a recent recipient of the American uh, Medal of Honor was Sergeant Dakota Meyer. He was responsible for single-handedly rescuing nearly three dozen comrades in 2009 in a battle in Afghanistan. Over a six-hour period, he made five different trips back out into danger to rescue wounded and fallen fellow, and fallen fellow soldiers. After it was over, he was asked the question, were you afraid you were going to die? He said, he said, I didn't think I was going to die. I knew I was. I knew I was. But do you see that, that attitude that allowed him to keep going back out? He, and he, in essence, had already died before he went out. He had already accepted his death, or he wouldn't have continued. Folks, do you see what that says to us? Have, have we accepted our death to ourselves so that God's will can be done through us? And the answer often in many Christian lives is no. And that's why that God's work on this earth is just kind of at a, at a standstill quite often. The choice comes down to us. And so that's the question we're asking today. Am I, am I following Jesus? <clears throat> you know, we're not, and may never be called to actually physically risk our lives for Jesus Christ, but will we just even step out of our comfort zone? Right? Will we step out of our comfort zone so that others, we can connect with other Christians and encourage them so that we can share the truth with those who need it? We've got our calling kind of clear in our minds now, so now we're ready to look at three men who at least had the idea that they were following Jesus. Let's see if they really were. Luke chapter 9, if you're there, look down at verse 57. So Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. As they were going along the road, in other words, as Jesus said to the disciples, and someone said to him, I will follow you wherever 
you go. Now, man, that was probably very encouraging to Jesus, wouldn't you think? In fact, as this man, you know, offers his service to Jesus, it probably got very quiet around Jesus. And then there probably was a buzz in the, in the, in the audience because Matthew chapter 8 tells us, verse 19, that this man was a scribe. He was a scribe. And so the scribes, in case you don't know, they were a very elite class of people. They were, they were greatly looked up to. They themselves were teachers and looked up to in that way. They were particularly teachers of the Old Testament law, and they were very loyal to that whole system, both of what the Old Testament stated and also what had become tradition. All those rules and regulations they were loyal to. And you see, that's the very thing Jesus was often teaching against, was that legalism. And so most of the scribes and Pharisees hated Jesus, but here comes one, and he says, I'm willing to follow you. In fact, he calls him teacher or didaskalos, which was a very, a very um, honoring title that this teacher calls Jesus. And, you know, I'm sure the, you know, the, the, the disciples were, were impressed and, and others, and they're probably thinking, wow, boy, he'll make a great follower. Man, he's going to really add a lot to the team. And then Jesus' response comes in verse 58. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, and I can just picture the disciples like looking at each other like, What? What did he just say? Does he know who this guy is? What's he saying that for? They were surprised, but Jesus has a reason behind it. And there's several reasons that we're going to see this morning, and um, I want us to grasp these and draw them into our own lives. Because you see... <clears throat> What Jesus is doing here is he's he's cautioning this this scribe. He's actually cautioning us and all who will ever follow him of a danger. And here it is. This is our first danger. It's a danger of a comfortable commitment. You got that? The danger of a comfortable commitment. You see, those words don't actually go together. Comfortable commitment. Commitment. What can we learn from this first encounter? Well, we've got to remember some things. First of all, Jesus could see into this man's heart. Okay, and he can see into our hearts, right? He could see in his heart, and he knew the inner motive. All, all they could see, all we can see is the outside, and some, often that's a facade. We know it, we do it, we know others do it. That external may not mean really that much. Um, so we need to remember that also. Jesus doesn't criticize him here, okay? He doesn't say your motive is wrong. He simply cautions him about something He says, I'll follow you anywhere. And Jesus cautions him about something that may become true, that he may no longer have a home. And he's just simply saying, are you sure? Have you weighed the cost? As he says, I will follow Jesus. The obvious point is um, that we must leave some things behind if we follow Jesus. We must leave some things behind if we follow him. The foxes that are mentioned here are actually still live in Palestine today. There are several varieties of them. And if you know much about these mammals, they're mostly nocturnal, so they do their foraging for food at night. And then in the daytime, they're back in their, their protective zone, back in their security realm, back in their comfort zone where they can rest securely from the outside. Jesus talks about the birds, and we know that birds have their safe place to, to nest. you ever see a bird sit down in the middle of your yard and just go to sleep right there in the middle of the yard? No, because they don't feel safe there. They have safety places. Have you ever noticed on, on Bluff Hill, the side facing towards the ocean, all those little holes in the side? And have you ever seen all the pigeons that make their roost there? Man, I tell you what, I thought, man, that's got to be a safe place for a pigeon to roost. So it's security. It's security. That's really what's being described right now. It's what Jesus wants us to kind of hone in right now are our comfort zones. Our comfort zones. We've all got them. We've all got things and spots where we, you know, we stop at that point because beyond that is uncomfortable. Places we like to be because that's comfortable. Places we avoid because it's not comfortable. That's what, so hear me now, that's what Jesus is wanting us to check out this morning is our comfort zone. Um, those overhearing this conversation that day, probably without a doubt, every one of them had a home to go to. They had that place when dusk came, they would return to and they would be secure Think about this for a moment. Three years for Jesus' three years of ministry, he didn't have a home. He didn't say, well, come see at my home, Ab, because he did not have a home. Imagine living that way, not having a home. 
<clears throat> many of us thought about the, this past week. <clears throat> Maybe even when the rains were coming and we didn't know what was going to happen, or at least we had a home for something to happen to. He didn't even have a home. It was three years, no home. <clears throat> I mean, just think about some of the things he gave up to leave heaven. <clears throat> he left the glories of heaven. He, um, he came to an earth where, you know, much more primitive world than what we enjoy today. No warm showers. <clears throat> I don't know about you, I, I've, I've got to have my shower every day, right? You know, no warm showers. And then much of the hygiene that we have today, not available. No home, no sanctuary of his own. We, we, we all know that feeling, right? You get home, you shut the door, and it's kind of like, now, now I can relax, now I can rest. That's our, that's our comfort zone, right? that wrong? Not necessarily, <clears throat> but are we evaluating it? That's important. Think about that for a moment. <clears throat> our home, our sanctuary. <clears throat> you know, um, this past week, I think I've got a slide of, of the rain. Is that the next one coming? Yeah, that's an actual photo a few days ago of, from the air of Napier, and some of you were kind of in those areas. Um, think about that for a moment, you know, um, but imagine now thinking about it, not even having a home to go to when it was raining, right? I was glad. I had to go out in it several times, and, and um, I was always glad when I got back home and, and got back in, but he didn't have that. So think about, for a moment, <clears throat> our home, our sanctuary. Let's think about that comfort zone. That is a, a huge blessing, a huge gift that God has provided for us, right? I mean, we cannot, you know, we, hopefully we wouldn't be foolish enough to think that we are completely the ones who have provided that for ourselves. And think about other things that we have. But what, here's the sad thing, is that often the things that God gives us to bless us become the things that keep us from following him. Right? I mean, how do you think that makes him feel he blesses us with something and then we hang on to it and don't do what he wants us to do? And, and our homes can certainly be that way. And, and I, I have to say our homes in that way because technically they don't belong to us. I'm, I'm not saying I know the bank owns most. I'm not saying that. I mean, they just don't, even when we pay off the mortgage, they don't belong to us. I'll put a verse on the screen from Deuteronomy that shows us that he, he owns it all and just calls us to be stewards of his holdings. And he allows us to enjoy them while we're stewards. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth, with all that is in it. It's his, right? So, well, no, I'm working hard and paying my mortgage. You control the economy. You control your ability to have, to have a job. You control national and international crises. You know, we could be like a third world country pretty quickly. And we, we take that for granted. We think it's mine. No, it's not. It's his. But he really is blessing us right now. And I think sadly, and I have to struggle with this too, we, we begin to worship his gifts instead of worshiping him. Right? I think that's called idolatry, isn't it? And yet we fall in it. Here's, here's a couple of questions, and you can customize them for yourself, but these are, these are helpful. What, which bothers you the most? Your floor and vacuumed or missing a connect group with brothers and sisters in Christ? Which bothers you most? Your favorite sports team losing or the realization that you've got a neighbor who's lost without Christ? Which, which bothers us the most? Which bothers us the most? Two days in a row of rain here in Hawks Bay where that shouldn't happen or the knowledge that a brother or sister in Christ is struggling in their walk? Which of those bothers us the most? You see how easy it is to actually become idolaters, worshiping God's blessings in our lives. And so, let's get practical. Our homes. Let's talk about our physical homes for a moment. The question is, am I following Jesus or thinking about myself? Here's, here's the statement. Do my daily choices show that mm, belongs to Him? So you can put your address in there. You can put certain possessions, certain areas of comfort in your life that you want to hang on to. Do, do my choices, day in and day out, indicate that that belongs to him? Or does it look more like I think it belongs to me? That's the question we're asking. If we can keep this in mind, I think it helps. It, it, it belongs to God. He's allowing us to have it, use it, enjoy it, and use it for him during the current time. Are we using it wisely for him? I'm afraid what we do often is we cling to like our homes 
And I know you young people, you don't own a home yet, so we'll say your room, okay? That becomes your room, you know, becomes your, your comfort zone. And what we do is we, we selfishly cling to those things and we escape there and we escape what God calls us to do. Whether it's our room, our house, we, we hide there. We hide in whatever our comfort zone is, which keeps us then from connecting with other Christians, right? It keeps us from going out of our home to those who need to hear about Jesus Christ to share that with them. And so we've got things really backwards in our lives. And here's another side of it, too, to think about. God actually wants us to stay in our home sometimes, but get out of our comfort zone in our home by inviting others into our home, right? I mean, there's nobody on the planet that isn't refreshed and encouraged when they're invited into someone else's home and they're fed a meal. Uh, that's, we, we know that, what's that. that is just such, a, just such a relaxing thing, and we can minister in that way. But no, we see it as our home. No, it's not. It's God's home. He wants us to use it in that way. You know, or, or inviting you know, other Christians, inviting um, not unsafe people into the home for a meal. See, those are ways that we can use God's home that we live in for him. And other ways too, right? Um, you know, putting something up at Christmas that talks about the real Christmas meaning. Anything like that are things we can do. And we can share his love that way. So, of course, when Jesus said foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, he wasn't just talking about our home. That was one illustration that he gave. So we don't want to just apply it to that. We want to really apply it to everything that we have. I mean, another thing would be our cars, for example. He said, well, how can you use your car for God? Well, there's one way that I talk about from time to time, right? These empty seats in our cars when we come to church, right? Most of our cars uh, will seat five people. Probably on average, there were two people in that car, right? Just think, if, if we, all we did was, I mean, no new cars in the parking lot. If we just fill up every car that's already here, we'd probably double the size of what's here right now. And I'll tell you a really easy way to do that okay, is like this, and it would apply to everyone here. There are children on your street, right? And, and you have ch friends who have children, and these parents would love to have an hour and a half break from their children and would gladly say, sure, take them to church with you, right? And, you know, they could be reached in that way. There's three new girls here with us, little girls here with us this morning. And where I picked them up from, yeah, you, it would help you understand how we need to reach people, okay? It's, there's so many there, and it's so easy, and that's just one way. Fill the seats of our cars. Just, just, let's begin to see that following Jesus means remembering that it's not our stuff anyway. It's his stuff, and he's honored us and blessed us by allowing us to be managers of those things. And I know you might be thinking, oh, it's my car and I will ride it by myself, thank you. Okay, well, I mean, you know, that's up to you. But just know that God, you know, is in a very interesting stewardship and he might then downgrade you to a moped, right? Because uh, technically that's all you need for one person, right? So, um, yeah, be careful there. Just saying, just saying, okay? And you young people, you know, um, I know right now you, say you don't have homes, you don't have cars, but you know what? God has given you things, hasn't he? He's given you a number of things. He's given you a mind. Don't be wasting it. Don't be lazy in school, right? Because God will use those things later in life that you learn. He's given you a voice, and not just to sing, but a voice to talk. He's given you friends. And I wonder how many of you sitting here are undercover Christians, right? Would, you, would the fellow students around you even know you're a Christian? Don't be that. Don't be that. Let's use these things that God puts in our care in this way. So, you know, you fill in the blank. You know, we, we can easily cross our arms, but it's mine. You know, it's my time, my money, my life. I'm not telling you that following Jesus is not hard. It is hard. It, it will stretch us. It will pull us out of our comfort zones. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and that's hard. So you say, why why would we do that? I want to tell you what I believe is really the only true motivation that will <clears throat> consistently keep you doing this, stepping out of your comfort zone, and it is this one thing, the love of Christ. His love for us is the one thing that will, not Pastor Joel telling you over and over again and growling you, that won't do it, okay? Hopefully it will remind you. Don't look to me, look to Christ, though. Look to his love for you as your motivation. Great passage on the screen. 1 Corinthians 
6, 19 and 20, it says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I think we're getting there now, aren't we? What's the motivation? The price that was paid for us, right? That, that love. You know, and, and honestly, I urge each of us to daily, you know, think about the cross again. Daily think about what Christ endured for us, that amazing love. Think about a father who was willing to allow his perfect son to die for us. That's our motivation. There's a story told about a, a ty- tyrannical husband who was just so, so hard on his wife. He literally wrote out rules and regulations for her, certain things that she had to do for him as a wife, as a mother, as a homemaker. And, and she followed the rules, but with no joy. And she began to actually despise doing these things because of just how belligerent he was. Then one day, he died. No, she didn't put poison in his apple pie, okay? He just died. It just happened. He died. And sometime later, she falls in love with another man, and and she's married. This marriage is different. It could be described as a perpetual honeymoon. And she, I mean, she serves him with her life willingly. And something interesting, ha- interesting happened a bit later on. She was cleaning the house, and she found one of those old lists that her, hu- her old ex-husband, her dead husband, had given to her. And she began reading those different things she was required to do. And you know what she found that was so interesting? She was doing every one of those things for her husband now and loving doing it. What's the difference? She's doing it for love, right? She's doing it for love. Folks... That is our motivation, doing it for love. Do not serve Jesus Christ out of duress. Do not serve him out of feelings of guilt. Serve him because of his love for us. That's what he calls us to. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. That's the motivation. I, uh, years ago when I was doing uh, apprenticeships for ministry, one of, the, one of the ministries I was involved in was children's ministry in our church back in, in America. And um, we had a, a number of children, probably had probably 30 or more children there. And, and, and we also had a, what was called a bus ministry there. So some of the children were brought in from, from, from environments like we describe and see here sometimes. And, and they weren't the best behaved. And one little boy in particular was incredibly belligerent. And at that era in my life, I didn't have the greatest amount of patience. And trying to, to keep him where he needed to be and all that wasn't always easy. But I remember the man who, um, who was the director of, the, of that, that department, um, Jimmy Gobble. And I remember him on several occasions just saying to me, he said, just take him back to the cross. Take him back to the cross. And what do you think he was also saying was, Joel, go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. You see, that's the whole point. Whatever we're going through, no matter how hard the calling on our life gets, take it back to the cross. Remember what he's done. Because, you see, that just, that just flattens everything out, doesn't it? We'll never, ever, ever do anything comparable to what he did for us. Think about it. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how far we have to move from that comfort zone, right? It's nothing compared to what he did for us. Any of you recognize the name of Dr. Harry Ironside? You ever heard that, that name? He, is a, he was a, a Bible teacher, pastor, theologian, author, who is more known in New Zealand because he actually is buried in Cambridge. He was a Canadian, but ministered quite a bit here in New Zealand. And actually on one of his, well, actually his final speaking tour here in New Zealand, he died and was, was buried in Cambridge. His father is less well known. Harry's father's name was John. And he's partly less known because he died at a very early age, at the age of 27, Harry came down with typhoid and, and died. I'm sorry, not John died at the age of 27. Harry was only two at the time. But something that he said on his deathbed makes him memorable. He was lying there and literally dying, and um, he began mumbling about something there as he was fading in and out. And it was actually what took place in Acts chapter 10. And many of you remember that, that very interesting passage where the, the Jews are understanding that they're moving from the Old Testament uh, uh, era to the New Testament. And that sheet comes down from heaven, you remember, to Peter. And there are these animals in it that he'd never eaten in his life because under the Old Testament law they weren't to. And the voice from heaven says, take and eat. It's okay. And Peter says, I can't eat. And he says, the voice says, yes. And he said, well, why was this guy on his deathbed thinking about that? And so as he began, he began muttering this, a great sheet and wild animals and, and, 
And he said that several times, and a friend next to him realized he was grasping for the next words, and he said, he said, John, it says creeping things. And John says, oh, yes, that's it. That's how I got in. I was just a poor, good-for-nothing creeping thing, but I got in saved by grace. Folks, we got to remember that. You know, we were, we were that too. We were just a good-for-nothing creeping thing. How is it that we could talk to the God of this universe as our Father? Because of His grace, because of His mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm sure you're kind of wondering how this trial went, if you don't know the history of it, with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, accused of treason as spies. Well, once again, I'll put on the screen the, the, their lawyer's last statement, and it was this, Your Honor, what my clients ask for is justice. Well, Judge Irving Kaufman's reply was actually biblical. I don't know that he intended it to be. I know he, had, he did do some, some Christian training. Um, and, and yet it was, it's very, very pointed. And here's what he said. Put it on the screen. Thanks, guys. The court has given what you ask for, justice. What you really want is mercy, but that is something this court has no right to give. And they were found guilty, and they were put to death for their crime, which there were was, there was some who believed they were innocent, but after all the court documents were able to be released many years later, it became very, very obvious that they had done exactly what they were accused of. But I want you to think about that event now. And think about what that judge said. He said, you know, that the court will give you justice. What you want is mercy, but this court is not able to give mercy. And that's right. A court of law doesn't have the, the, really the right to, to give mercy in that way. But I want you to think as we close. Now, I'm almost finished. So I want you to, to hang with me with this last, <clears throat> last few lines. Think about what our God did. Our God satisfied justice. He didn't ignore justice in regard to us. He, how did he satisfy justice? He satisfied justice by punishing his son for us. So justice was meted out on his son. And then, having done that, he was allowed to, he was able to justly offer us mercy and forgiveness. And that can be received by anyone if we'll just swallow our, our damnable pride, right, and receive it. That's, that's all it is. So the, so the danger we looked at today is this. We're just looking at one of these guys today, a comfortable commitment. I urge us as we close, I urge us to evaluate our commitment to Jesus Christ. We may would say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, but is it only to the point where our comfort ends? If so, that's not much of a follower, is it? Put one last statement on the screen that I think sums this all up well. Jesus took our place. We just talked about that. Jesus took our place. Now he simply asks us to take his place, right, on this earth. He's not here doing it. He's asked us to take his place and to share his love with everyone. Are we doing that? Are we following him? Are we thinking about ourselves? Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, your word always rings true. Your Son, Jesus Christ, stands as an example for us for all times of how we should. It's not an easy walk. It's not a walk possible without your power in our lives, but we have that. I don't know where you are in your walk with Christ at this current moment. Some of you perhaps have not yet surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ. I urge you to do that. Many here have turned to Jesus Christ, but the question is, are we following him or are we thinking about ourselves? Maybe right now in this closing moment, you're ready to surrender things to him. Dear Heavenly Father, stir our hearts, light with the Holy Spirit's power every corner of our lives for us to see the, the selfishness, the self-focus, the lack of following, Lord, so that we can truly, in the days we have left on this earth, be followers who walk in the pattern of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.